Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Symposium on Reparations, Repatriation, and Redress, um, hosted by the Riggs Initiative, Race, Indigeneity, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Initiative at the University of Minnesota. I'm Karen Ho. I'm a professor in anthropology and also director of the Riggs Initiative. Um, before we actually begin um, with the panels, we actually want to begin with an opening prayer. Um, Corey Bazemore James, who is the Graduate School Diversity Office Director of Retention and Success, is going to lead us um, in this important opening. And uh, followed by Professor David Chang, who's chair of the American Indian Studies Program, or the department, excuse me. Um, and he is going to give us a context of the um, violence and the conditions of possibility that have actually engendered the land grant institution, and um, to give uh, the important and broader context of the native land on which uh, we are all um, at. So, Corey. Uh, hello and welcome. My name is Corey Bazemore James. Uh, I'm from the Seneca Nation, but I speak to you in Lakota because I grew up in South Dakota. Um, thank you, Karen, for asking me to pray, so I'll do that. <clears throat> thank you for giving us this day together, uh, and giving us health and wellness to be here together to speak about these very important topics. Please allow for healing today and good conversations and love and respect for one another. Please allow those of us who really need to hear these words and personal stories to really hear, hear these stories and for those who need to be heard to feel heard and respected and loved. And thank you for for bringing us together and, and please take care of those who are sick and those in prisons and in places that are, that they are because of, of these issues of racism and, and colonization and, and please take care of our students and help them in this time in this colonized space that we call the college and university in this, on this land. Thank you, Corey, for starting us that way. Um, that was on the fly and a last minute request and gracious of you. Thank you very much. Am I loud enough to be heard in the back? Is that good? OK, cool. Thank you very much. Um, so today, I, I was, this came out of a brief conversation with uh, Karen as she was discussing this, Karen Ho as she was discussing the possibilities here. And something that I care very, la la I, I care very much about, and many, many people at public universities across the United States talk about, is the moral land grant and land grant universities. And as a person who works in indigenous history and who cares deeply about histories of land, of conquest and power in the United States, this raises very complicated issues for you. So let me start off by putting you to sleep with a quick history lection um, on land grant universities because they matter a lot for us. Um, so the reason that so many faculty and so many state legislators and so many students care about moral land grants around the universe, or around the country is because it created a foundation for universities and colleges which were dedicated to the public good. And so we think of this and we talk about this and we use it to argue for the necessity of the university working for the public good. It empowers us to make that claim, right? Sometimes in the face of administrators or members of the public who really may not really think of the university as being about the public good and, and needing to respond to that. Um, and so, but we need to think about it in some very complicated ways once we take that land and we demystify it and we historicize it just a little bit. The Morrill Land Grant Act was signed in 1862 in the midst of the war under the administration of President Lincoln. It transferred federal lands to states as an endowment so that those states could use that money from selling the land 
to build universities that would serve the public interests, quote, for the benefit of agriculture and the mechanical arts, and also, we hope, for higher learning. This was public land policy, and it served white settlement, the capitalist transformation of North America, and the development of the state. The lands were to be sold. Selling the land would encourage white settlement and agricultural and urban development. This would fund the wealth of the state. Land would be transferred from federal hands to states. States would sell it. It would therefore enter the tax rolls. This would further empower the state. The proceeds of the sales of lands would then be reinvested by the universities to create more wealth, creating a sustainable basis for universities. This is the endowment. This is the foundational endowment for the University of Minnesota existed prior to this for 11 years, but it was a poor, small, little institution. And this is true for public universities across the United States. So what this land did was it created the foundation literally the foundation um, for the wealth of the institution. And it's been widely championed by liberal discourses in many places because the university must serve the people. There is nobility in that goal. There is utility in that discourse. Um, but let's remember that the first endowment of federal lands as reinvested and reinvested again, as transformed in the marvelous the marvelous mutability of capital, which we all know and understand, that that money still exists. It pays for this building. It pays for the lands upon which we're walking right now. It pays my salary, and it pays the salary of many people in this room. So let's think about that federal land, that federal land that was transferred in 18, by a law created in 1862 and then later changed over time. Here in Minnesota, Every inch of the federal land was native land. Here in Minnesota, Makoche, as the Dakota called this land of Minnesota, every inch of that land belonged to the Dakota nations in the south and the Ojibwe nations in the north. It was federal land only because the federal government had taken it from native people. So let's think about that land. We live, for example, right here, we are on the land of the Midewakanton Dakota. Okay, please say with me, Midewakanton. Dakota. Dakota. Midewakanton, Dakota. Dakota. That's where you are. So you can say when you're asked where you live or where you're from, it's good to know where one is. And we are on the land of the Midewakanton, Dakota. The federal government had taken every inch of that land of the Midewakanton Dakota, of the other Dakota nations, and of the Ojibwe nations to the north in just 25 years before 1862. This is not ancient history in this foundation of this university or of this state. This is recent and foundational history which still creates the possibilities of our present. Those lands were taken in a series of coercive and dishonest treaties. Until the year 1837, the only white-held land in Minnesota Makoche was one U.S. fort. Fort Snelling, about six miles southeast of where you sit right now. That fort occupied nine square miles. The rest of what we now call Minnesota is 86,934 square miles. In 1837, all of that 86,934 square miles was controlled, occupied, fruitfully used, and collectively owned by the Ojibwe and Dakota nations. In 25 years after 1837, one generation, the time that it takes for a child to be born, to grow to maturity, and to enter into the possibilities and the responsibilities of adulthood, in those 25 years, 86,934 square miles were taken in a series of treaties. Those treaties lay in the foundation of our present. They are why we have much of our present day. This is why I am here. Um, and they also lie in the origins of another event of 1862, the 1862 U.S.-Dakota War, when the abysmal and irresponsible 
an immoral failure of the federal government to live up to its responsibilities, its paltry responsibilities under previous treaties to the Dakota Nations, led to a war um, where the Dakota, where, where many in the Dakota um, Nations said that this would not stand. This would not be a fait accompli. This war was lost by the Dakota Nation, which led to the expulsion of the entire Dakota Nation. Many ran as refugees far and wide up to the Red River settlements um, in what is now Manitoba, west to what is now South and North Dakota. The rest were rounded up, held in a concentration camp at Fort Snelling. Perhaps one third of the people held in that camp died underfed, underclothed, and underheated in the winter of 1862-1863. 38 men were hanged in the largest mass execution in the United States history. The remainder either went into hiding, and some people did hide and stay here, or were forced west, largely to the Crow Creek Reservation in South Dakota. Some have trickled back, and we have Dakota communities here today. This is the story of this land. I've centered it appropriately on the history of the Midwakanton Dakota because I want to talk about land and I want to talk about where we are and how that matters today. So that Indian land story lives in this institution, lives in this room, lives in my salary, lives in how I feed my children, okay? That's just how that works. Um, and, but it also lives in the presence of Native American people in our communities and God bless us on our campus. Um, Today, one thing that I want to say before I say some other things is that many Native people thrive. They are among us as PhDs. They lead us in the state. They, have, are, they, are, they are vitally important to our communities, and many are doing well, but many are not. Many are not doing well, okay? Because you cannot take all of somebody's land in one reservation, in, in, one, in one generation, can put them on reservations, have a policy of genocide, deacculturation, um, and taking their children and sending them boarding schools. You cannot do that without creating trauma that's going to last for generations. It's a policy, just as the land policy created the state of Minnesota, so did policy towards American Indians create the very real difficulties that American Indian people face today. Mis difficulties which you could witness if you go four-tenths of a mile south on Cedar Avenue to the corner of Hiawatha to an encampment of over 200 homeless the tents housing homeless people, well over 200 people, which people are calling the Wall of Forgotten Natives because it is largely um, Native American. Um, yesterday on National Public Radio, a very wonderful story um, was conducted with a woman who lives at that encampment with her four adult children and her grandchildren. And she was quite remarkable. And she said, I I've had chances to be relocated, but only to shelters by myself or to an apartment that would just be for me. So what policy was trying to do was to take her and treat her just as an individual, to pull her out of the webs of kinship which have allowed her and her people to survive for generations. She didn't say it that way, but that's what that is. This is a policy of changing Native American family and also gender norms in order to create a normative citizenship uh, upon a land that's been taken away from them. She refuses. She says, no, that's just not what I'm going to do. I've, I've always been with them. I will be with them. But she said, if only we still, she said, if only we still had that land, the land. Because in the old days, we could have gone someplace and we could have lived together. This was incredibly historically and politically astute. And I want you to know that this knowledge and this politics lives in people's minds. That there's an analysis of the problem which brings us back to the question of land, appropriation, and what is appropriate in the present day. And she brought that into the radios of people across the state and the region. I wish we had all that land. This didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to be this way. It did not have to be that we are teaching in universities that are based upon the taking of other people's lands. It does not need to be that our president lives in a house that was built by enslaved labor. It did not need to be that, the, that fine universities across the United States were built by the labor of enslaved people. But we know these things, and I wanted you guys to know it in a particular context that's appropriate to this land. Knowledge creates responsibility. Now, and we know these things. So the question that we have now is what do we do with this knowledge? It seems to me that what's going on for the next few days is a conversation about knowing the creations 
uh, knowing the conditions that create our present, and then with that knowledge, thinking forward about what we do. I hope you have a wonderful meeting. Hi, I have a few opening remarks, and then I also want to introduce our wonderful panelists. So again, I'm Karen Ho, Director of uh, the Race, Indigeneity, Gender, Sexuality Initiative. Thank you so much to Carrie Bazemore James and David Chang uh, for those really thoughtful, brilliant, and uh, thought-provoking and uh, compelling remarks. So what happens when there are debts that can never be repaid? This set of events, this symposium on reparations, repatriation, and redress brings together multiple disciplines, communities, colleges to think through the challenges of and possibilities for repair, atonement, return, and or apology as potential ways to address some of the foundational wrongs of the U.S. that have shaped long-standing institutional structures and inequalities. We want to bring front and center a difficult and historically non-starter topic to invite wide-ranging conversations around the politics, policies, and roadblocks around seeking atonement for historical and ongoing injustices. We will question the impoverishment of our imaginations when it comes to thinking about land claims for Native peoples, reparations for African Americans, um, and redress for Asian Americans and multiple other minoritized and marginalized uh, social groups. We're interested in exploring whether and to what extent the rubric of reparations addresses the continuing inequality experienced by indigenous communities and multiple communities of color. Using a critical and comparative approach to reparations, repatriation, and redress, and engaging with multiple communities, we hope to catalyze thought around potential strategies to address systemic, racial, um, and social economic inequalities. We have four panels. I hope you all got a program. One is on models for restorative action, which we want to begin with, again, to catalyze and um, promote thought around and across these issues, but also to really put front and center the ways in which we can both recognize ongoing and historical injustices and trauma, but also think through possibilities um, of hope and of struggle and of resistance. Our second panel is on universities and historical injustices. Day two, tomorrow, uh, we, have a, we begin with a panel on critical and comparative reparations, repatriation, and redress. And we end with the case uh, for reparations. It's an actually important to note that after each panel session, we're going to have an open discussion in the Humphrey Atrium, which I invite you all to participate in. We have many graduate students who um, have valiantly volunteered to facilitate those conversations. And um, it'll be in that sort of carpeted area in the Humphrey Atrium, which we hope to, again, sort of engender and continue discussion. I just have a few opening remarks in terms of um, you know, one of the sort of key reasons why we wanted to do this uh, uh, symposium. And uh, obviously, we also have a lot of folks to thank. So I want to make sure to do that, too, because I often forget to do that. Um, uh, so you know, th that's really uh, important. So first, some of the opening remarks. A bit ago, James Baldwin brilliantly Lee observed that the category of whiteness itself is a powerful fiction that traffics in innocence and an investment in privilege. So when we think about innocence, what does that do to thinking about reparations, repatriation, and redress? When we actually have a very different understanding of the larger social and historical and political context in which we engage the world, what are the ramifications for repatriation, rep reparations, and redress? Many historians, and I'm thinking in particular Sven Beckert, has talked about how war capitalism and Cedric Robinson racial capitalism have intermeshed with settler colonialism to produce seemingly opportunities without end, seemingly land without end. Right? Historians have actually pointed 
that Southern planters thought of their understanding of the cotton empire as having access to, quote, unencumbered land. That, and it is precisely the empire of cotton right, that led in large part to the ascendancy of the West. Think about these assumptions and models. Right? And then here I'm going to quote in particular um, the Beckert who actually writes, what distinguishes the United States from virtually every cotton growing area in the world was planter's command of nearly unlimited supplies of land, labor, and capital, and their unparalleled political power. Now it's important to remember that enslaved people were people who were both capital and labor, right? Collateral, as well as the conditions of possibility to accumulate capital. Capital and the possibility to grow capital. So it's precisely these conditions that led to the assumption of the world, of the land, of labor, of wealth creation as something that was possible. The hyper-accumulation of wealth and growth, the assumption of limitlessness, as we can see, was only made possible through enslavement, racial capitalism, and settler colonialism. So isn't it striking that today, the model in which we think of the world is that of scarcity, right? Is that of scarcity. There is little to share. One could argue, why is it that most of it's already quite taken up? Right? So in a sense, if we, if we sort of take at face value that model of scarcity without thinking about the conditions of its production, right? why is it that so many people have so little and so few people have so much? Right? That in, in a sense, we're indicting the very economic theory of development. We're indicting the very economic theory of development. Now, of course, today, Folks will often say there are very few perpetrators of this who are still alive today, and yet there are many, many beneficiaries, right? So not only do we have to think about the category of the beneficiary, but again, the conditions of production that made it so that someone's imagining of the world was that of limitlessness, of an unlimited supply. Today, and of course, you know, I'm a, a social cultural anthropologist, so I often think about the conditions of the present. And what does the conditions of the present, the genealogies of the present, and how does that help us reflect on the case for reparations? Now, today we live under conditions of hyper inequality. Inequality in the US, uh, most of you know, have surpassed that of the Great Depression. In fact, it, suppressed, it has surpassed that of uh, the Belle Epoque in aristocratic Europe, um, as well as the ancient regime. And certainly particular powerful actors today have seized on conditions of hyper inequality to mobilize an avalanche of discontent among many in the downwardly mobile as a, in, a key, in a way that misrecognizes the key causes of their predicament and scapegoats those at the margins of social hierarchies. This Molotov cocktail, longstanding hierarchies and othering discourses fueled by precarity and resentment helps to solidify the terrifying and increasingly common sense rhetoric that a permissive social order has allowed the formerly marginalized to take advantage of the system such that recipients of undeserving handouts triumph over the normative and the hardworking. This imagined social order appears to be the manifestation of decades of conservative thought, right? And the thought that I was uh, talking about where reverse discrimination is a central problematic and is wrongly asserted as a new uncovered hidden truth, where minoritized communities collude with corrupt government elites to wrangle undeserving special interests at the expense of people who have become strangers suddenly in their own land. If this is a social context, then restoring a prior social order means privilege, privileging the security of white men and their families. If the social fabric has been retrofitted to bolster the lie of, say, reverse racism, then it comes to no surprise that non-facts must necessarily substitute for the larger social context. If reverse discrimination is the imagined order, yet social facts 
point to a different reality, one where racism, nativism, and large-scale disinvestment in infrastructure and the social safety net continue to dismantle the life chances of minority communities even more than those who were previously protected, yet who are also experiencing significant decline, then the social facts are themselves wrong. Is the result a massive suspicion of the truth? What are the ramifications for deploying narratives of unfairness and elite advantage, not only for specific personal claims to power, but to reverse and undermine the very struggles and gains of minoritized social movements in the past half century? I say this because this is actually why it's even more important at this moment to engage with reparations, repatriation, and redress. Because the very social fabric has been reoriented toward the fiction of reverse discrimination. And that fiction, to actually um, ameliorate that fiction, necessitates the restoring of the security for the privileged. And we need to both undermine that social fiction right, and the fiction of innocence. And it's precisely through these kinds of engagements um, that, that it's uh, my hope that we do this, or uh, engage with this. So with that, there are many people to thank. Uh, I want to thank the Institute for Advanced Study I want to thank uh, the College of Liberal Arts and the Interdisciplinary uh, Collaborative Workshop. I want to thank the Humphrey School. Um, the Humphrey School actually comped this room, so thank you. Um, I, I want to thank the uh, Institute for Global Studies. I want to thank the College for Education and Human Development. Um, I want to thank Sarah Cronquist, uh, who is the Riggs Programming Coordinator, who without whom this would not have been done. I want to thank David Lemke and Rashad Williams and Hannah, sorry, Hannah Mariama and Ezekiel uh, Jubert, who are, um, have been working on the Facebook page. So anyway, many, many thanks to you all. I'm sure I'll continue thanking more people uh, as we continue. But we've taken up enough time, and I want to introduce our first amazing set of panelists, and to thank you all for being here and for coming. Um, I will just read short bios from, um, of them. This panel is on models for restorative action, and I will start in alphabetical order. Um, Marvin Roger Anderson can you raise your hand? was born and raised in St. Paul. Upon graduation from Central High School, he attended Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, Hastings College of the Law and the University of Minnesota, um, earning BA, JD, and master's degrees respectively. After law school, Marvin served in the U.S. Peace Corps and on his return became a special assistant to the Minneapolis Department of Civil Rights. Um, after several years of corporate and private practice as a consultant, uh, Martin, Marvin obtained a master's degree in library science, worked at the University of Minnesota Law School until his appointment by the Minnesota Supreme Court to the position of state law librarian. In 1982, spurred by efforts of other neighborhood boosters to claim the title of St. Paul's Best Neighborhood, Marvin and his longtime friend Floyd Smaller Jr. saw the need to enter the name of Rondo into the friendly competition. With a goal in mind, they led the formation of Rondo Avenue and began planning for the Rondo Days Festival to be held the following year. In July 4th, 1983, the first Rondo Days Festival had, was held, welcoming thousands of current and former residents during its honor, inaugural weekend. For the past 34 years, Rondo Days has offered a multicultural celebration of art, music, dance, food, health, and community information, small business opportunities, and family fun. Mr. Anderson is a co-founder and first president of the Minnesota Association of Black Lawyers. He's a board member and past chair of the Archie Givens um, for African American Literature, a former board member of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, um, and he currently serves as the project director of the Rondo Commemorative Plaza, as well as chair of the board of directors for Reconnect Rondo, an organization with the mission to pursue a land bridge over the I-94 in the Rondo Corridor. Kate Bean, um, uh, sitting right there. Um, uh, Flandreau, Santi Dakota, and Muskogee Creek holds a BA in American Indian Studies and a doctorate in American Studies from the University of Minnesota. 
With an employment background rooted in history and education, she has worked in the Twin Cities as an after-school mentor for American Indian youth, an early childhood Dakota language immersion teacher, a public history consultant, and a college instructor. Previously, she served as a Charles A. Eastman Predoctoral Fellow at Dartmouth College and as President's Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She is currently manager of programs and outreach for Native American initiatives at the Minnesota Historical Society and teaches Dakota history at Minneapolis Community and Technical College. She lives in Minneapolis with her partner and their two young daughters. Carly is Bidwakatan one Dakota and Muscogee Creek, and she's a proud citizen of the Flandreau Santee Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. She's a graduate of Minneapolis Community and Technical College and the University of Minnesota, where she received a double major in American Indian Studies with a focus on the Dakota language and history. She's a 2011 graduate of the University of Minnesota Law School and is licensed to practice law in the state of Minnesota. She has previously taught the Dakota language to um, high five and kindergarten students at Ashinabe Academy in South Minneapolis. She has also provided legal work at a locally based firm specializing in Indian law and advocated for families at the Indian Child Welfare Act uh, Law Center. After graduating from law school, she worked as a law clerk for the presiding family court judge for the 4th uh, Judicial District, and then as an assistant court, uh, county attorney for the Hennepin County Attorney's Office in Child Protection. Currently, Carly is a Native Nations Activities Manager at the Bush Foundation, a regional funder whose focus is supporting community problem solving across Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and the 23 Native Nations that share the same geography. In this role, she works across all the foundation's program areas in their work um, in and with Native communities. Carly serves on the board of directors of the national member-based organization Native Americans in Philanthropy and the vice chair of the board of a local nonprofit and indigenous farm, Dream of Wild Health. She lives in South Minneapolis with her husband, Jay, and their one-and-a-half-year-old son, Quill, and loves to cook, read novels, and ride horses when she can. Joey Mogul. Uh, is a partner of the People's Law Office. Mogul's practice focuses on representing people who have suffered from police and other governmental torture, abuse, and misconduct in civil rights cases and defending individuals in criminal and capital cases. Mogul directs a civil rights clinic at DePaul Col University College of Law. Mogul has sought justice for Chicago police torture survivors for the past 20 years, successfully representing a number of Burge torture survivors in their criminal post-conviction proceedings and in federal civil rights cases. Mogul served as key co-lead counsel in litigation securing legal representation for the torture survivors who remain behind bars in post-conviction proceedings in 2014. Mogul also successfully presented a case to the UN Committee Against Torture in Geneva, Switzerland in 2006, obtaining a specific funding calling for the prosecution of the perpetrators. Mogul drafted the original City Council Ordinance providing reparations for the Burge torture survivors on behalf of the organization she initiated and co-founded Chicago Torture Justice Memorials. On May 16, 2015, the Chicago City Council unanimously passed unprecedented legislation providing reparations to the survivors and their family members, becoming the first municipality to provide systemic redress for racially motivated police violence. She re frequently re um, represents LGBTQ people in criminal court and civil rights proceedings and is co-author of Queer Injustice, the Criminalization of LGBT People in the United States. Guy Emerson Mount is an assistant professor of African American history at Auburn University. His work focuses on emancipation, black transnationalism, and the rise of American empire. His current book manuscript, The Last Reconstruction, Slavery, Emancipation, and Empire in the Black Pacific, follows the lives of formerly enslaved people in the Atlantic world who relocated in America's Pacific Empire as part of a long-forgotten state-sponsored proposal to colonize upwards of 60% of all African Americans in Hawaii and the Philippines after 1865. While completing his PhD at the University of Chicago, he also co-founded the Reparations at UChicago Working Group, which uncovered the University of Chicago's historical ties to slavery in 2017. The group is now organizing alongside activists on the south side of Chicago and is planning a national action conference in February of 2019 to address this legacy. 
Professor Mount currently teaches courses on reparative justice, African American life, and world history, Le the last of which he teaches as an open source digital classroom through Twitter at hashtag Auburn World History. His work has recently been honored by the American Historical Association, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Dwight D. Eisenhower Institute. He writes a monthly column for the largest online source of black history in the world, Black Perspectives, and is developing a weekly interview program and video channel for the African American Intellectual History Society. So without further ado, I want to welcome the panel and call. So yes, 